Ken White is the publisher of Sutherland House Books and the author of the weekly Shush. Shush or Shush? You can say it either way. Okay. The important uh, thing is to say it emphatically. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in France right now, so I'll say Shush. The Shush newsletter. He is a former editor in chief of Maclean's magazine and the former founding editor of the National Post newspaper. His books include Hoover, An Extraordinary Life in Extraordinary Times. Welcome, Ken, to the Bibliophile. Nice to be here, Nigel. Now, I just want to get the conflict of interest allegations out of the way. Okay. You approached me about a year and a half ago with a proposal to publish some ebooks of bibliophile transcripts, and we ended up publishing nine of them. And uh, to my knowledge, sales are now well into the single digits. I think so, yes. Yeah, so it's a huge conflict, and I'm glad that you pointed it out to everybody. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> a lot, lot of potential for real trouble there. Okay. I just, I just want to get it out on the table. Okay. We'll all see so, better now. So uh, about a month ago, you wrote an op-ed in the Toronto Globe and Mail, which basically argued that the increasingly aggressive lending practices of public libraries are seriously undermining book selling, the publishing industry, and author incomes. So how are they doing that? Well, first of all, let me take exception to your characterization of it as an op-ed, because, you know, that was a real serious essay. That was like 3,500 words, and I spent months on that, sucker. Uh, so, you know, uh, j just so the people out there who haven't had a chance to read it yet and understand that there was some substance to it. I wasn't just spouting off in, in my usual way. <laughs> uh, this is a, uh, an issue that I take rather seriously. And what, what I wanted to look at, I made a big mistake, Nigel, when I went into publishing business. I, I, uh, I, I had done a lot of work on, on media and media strategy when I was uh, in the media business, particularly at Rogers, which owned all kinds of media television, radio, magazines, digital media. And I, I learned a lot about media strategy there. And, and I applied what I knew to the publishing industry. And, and so, you know, the problem in magazines and newspapers was you had two sources of revenue and one of them advertising dried up completely. And uh, the other was revenue from readers, subscription revenue. Don't forget the six hundred million dollars, though. Or was that after your time? You mean the government money? Yeah, that, that came afterwards, uh, and and it's really not going to make a difference. It's just going to make uh, all of the taxpayers a little poor. But um, you know, the problem with subscription money was that newspapers and magazines chasing. Uh, advertising dollars had been giving away their content for free online. So when I came to look at the publishing industry, I thought, I thought publishing was in good shape. Overall revenues for the industry were pretty high uh, in historical terms, and and they were flat or growing one or two percent a year, which was a stable market. And they'd managed, uh, despite the digital revolution, to keep the prices up for their digital content. Uh, you know, if you go online, uh, you can buy a paperback copy of Your Move by uh, Sutherland House, John Kay and Joan Moriarty, uh, for about, you know, 18 bucks. Uh, you can buy an ebook for about 15 bucks. You can buy, not in this case, but in a lot of other cases, an audio book, which will be about, you know, probably about 20 bucks. So, you know, you have two digital formats, but the pricing is still much the same as it would be for a hard copy. So I thought, I thought publishers had done a brilliant job in the digital age of keeping their price for 
their product you know music hadn't done it music got really really dirt cheap uh and uh newspapers hadn't done it and magazines hadn't done it so you know i i thought good on the publishers and uh you guys are going to have a long and healthy uh or at least stable future and i was i was completely wrong uh because i've taken too narrow a view of the publishing market i was just looking at uh what got sold i wasn't looking at what got borrowed and uh i i wasn't looking at the overall market for how people get their books get their reading and and uh how much they pay for it and the deeper i got into the business the the more it became apparent to me that huge numbers of people were in fact getting their content for free they just weren't getting it online they were getting it from the public library and it took me a while to conceive that as a problem because like a lot of people i grew up in public libraries i love public libraries and and uh and who doesn't right it's like right. Uh, yeah. you can't you can't criticize them it's uh, it's no. suicide that's right yes yeah and 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 i still use libraries a lot both for my own work and uh for for events for my authors and other 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 things so i i got a lot of time and a lot of respect for libraries and i couldn't really conceive them as a problem but you know i i i kept talking to people people my own age people younger than me people with good jobs good incomes <laughs> and all i ever heard from them when they talked about books was yeah i got that one on hold uh, uh, in the university of toronto library system or uh yeah i just returned that one to edmonton public library and so on and i'd say to them you know you, you can afford to buy books you know you don't you don't have to borrow everything there's a, a poor writer on the other side of that who would appreciate a, a sale uh and they they would just laugh and say look it's free i'm going to go get it where it's free even if i have to wait for it for a while yeah and and it's you know never uh that long that you have to wait uh, i understand you can wait 15 20 weeks if if you want you know the latest margaret atwood right after it's been released uh, there can be quite a lineup but uh, generally speaking for 99 out of 100 books there's not a wait Uh so I thought I'd better look into it and see what what's going on with with the libraries and uh I looked at all the borrowing stats and uh I compared them to the sales stats and it's pretty clear that for every one book that gets bought at a bookstore or on Amazon in Canada there's about four others that are lent for free at the public library which means that 80% of the books that are being read in Canada are being read for free. That's like just that figure which you keep returning to. It's yeah. really difficult to believe that. How is it difficult to believe? You've got, you know, somewhere between I think it's in the neighborhood of about 1500 libraries, library branches in in Canada. You got about the same number of libraries and library branches and bookmobiles and candas you've got starbucks uh they're on you know pretty much every corner in every neighborhood has a public library and mm. uh the library really encourages people to use them encourages people to borrow and and uh it does this in a couple of ways one is you know when i was growing up libraries could kind of turn their noses up on a uh, popular fair they weren't carrying the mickey spillane novels in high volume or anything uh, they saw themselves as uh having a duty to edify rather than entertain their uh patrons and uh but that's changed over the last 50 years and and they've gone whole hog towards uh serving up uh, entertainment and uh as as i note in in my piece that's why you've got more than 50 copies of 50 shades of gray in the toronto public library system and only about you know five copies of stendhal's 
best works. Ken, what uh, were you able to determine what percentage of the books that they lend fall into this entertainment category? Um, I don't have an exact figure on that, Nigel, but if you look at uh, various libraries, including Toronto Public Library, the Seattle System have put out uh, their top 100 borrowed books of the year. And if you look at those lists, uh, you, you'll see uh, uh, that, you know, there, there are some good books in there, but for, for the most, there's a lot of James Patterson, there's a lot of Tom Clancy, uh, there, there's a lot of Eat, Pray, Love, you know, which, fine, they're d decent books, but they're also for, for sale. What you're talking about there, Ken, are books that have, are already sold in the, certainly in the millions. Mm -hmm. So you're basically saying libraries shouldn't be lending these so that publishers can make even more millions off those bestsellers? Yes, I am saying that, yes, uh, because the bestsellers are what float the publishing houses and uh, allow them to keep taking chances on new authors and to keep uh, other authors who don't sell as well in print. And uh, that's an you know, very important part of the uh, publishing ecosystem. Um, anyway, back to what's changed at libraries, you have libraries leaning more on entertain and, uh, entertainment, but also along the way they discovered that uh, they could improve their own funding, their own case for getting more funding from uh, the governments that fund them if they could show that there was more traffic in, in the libraries over time. And the one thing that drives traffic most is giving people free stuff, lending them books. And so the more they stocked books that people wanted to read uh, for fun rather than thought maybe they should read for edification, their numbers went up. They also started impressing on people that Every time you borrowed a book, you were saved the cost of buying a book. So, you know, the, the uh, American Library Association has a, a calculator on its site where you can put in the number of books you borrow. Say you take eight home from the library on the weekend. It'll show you that you've saved uh, uh, probably about $120, $140 by borrowing rather than buying those books and 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 it, so it's doing things like this constantly to this is, encourage this to people impress, this is to impress the people that are also funding them right to impress the people who are funding them and and also to impress the patrons to keep them coming back for more free entertainment my argument uh in, in the piece is that all of this free entertainment uh, is hurting publishing uh, on, on the whole because libraries are giving away books that uh, historically would have been bought in some volume. Not every book that's borrowed is a lost sale, but some measure of books that are borrowed represent lost sales. In fact, you posit that it's one in four, right? I'm guessing that it's one in four. The big scandal in all of this, Nigel, is that nobody's ever actually done any good hard research on, on how many it is. I mean, the libraries, when, when they're asking for f more funding or when they're trying to impress upon you how much you're saving, they say that every book you borrow is you're saving 16 bucks. That, that's um, how they're calculating it, right? One, one to one. That's how they're calculating it. I, do, I don't believe that. I, I think that uh, it's, it's got to be lower than that. So what about, I, uh, Ken, just about the uh, fact that libraries are funded by the amount of books they kind of get out the door uh, with people borrowing them. Is there any kind of evaluation of the kind of books that are being lent or not that you're aware of? Not, not what that I see in the funding requests uh, and, and in the materials that libraries use to uh, argue for, for more funding. They, they just talk about the demand for their services. Uh, and and uh, how it's going up and, and uh, all, how many people use the library and they don't talk about what they use it for. And, yeah. there, you know, there are a lot of great things that 
people use the library for, that people do use it to study, people do use it for work, people do use it to study for things like trade exams and driver's licenses, people use the computers there and take classes there. Libraries do a lot of great things, but what really drives the traffic is giving away the uh, uh, free stuff and, and, and lending books mostly for entertainment reading. And this is from their own statistics that shows that most people are reading for entertainment. Right, so what you're doing when you come up with that four out of five books are read for free in Canada, you, you're taking, you're hoisting the libraries on their own petard by using their own calculator to come up with what? The value of the books that are borrowed versus the, the value of the books that are sold in Canada? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Well, it, you know, if, if you take the libraries at their word and say that a, a book that's borrowed is a book that's not bought uh, and four out of five books is not bought, you, you know, you got all of a sudden across North America, I can't remember what the exact number is, but uh, in excess of 30 billion worth of books being borrowed a year when there's only about seven or eight billions uh, of, in books, trade books that are sold every year. So, you know, you've got uh, a library system that's like four or five times bigger than the uh, whole of the publishing system. And all of those books that are given away is some of that, say a quarter of it, which is my estimate, is uh, lost revenue to the publishing system. That would be enough to double the revenues for the publishing system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and why that's good, which is the major point of my piece, is that author incomes in North America are abysmal. You know, you get the average authors making somewhere between five and $10,000 a year as a writer, and that's down by more than half in, in the last 10 years. It's getting harder and harder for authors to earn a living. You're blaming that on the libraries. I'm saying the libraries are a big factor in that. The fact that four out of five books is given away for free makes it hard for anyone to, to run a business. That's the thing. Are publishers hurting then? Are they really in big trouble? I think it's the authors that are hurting most, more than publishers. My view is that, yes, publishers are hurting. Uh, the, the business is not growing, hasn't really grown if you uh, adjust for inflation in, in decades. And I think it's next to impossible to grow uh, in, in that kind of environment. They're mostly concerned, the big publishers, about lending ebooks and audiobooks, but let's leave that aside for the moment. And any publisher, anyone who makes anything who's giving away four out of five copies of it is going to have a hard time uh, sustaining growing uh, a, a business and uh, increasing the size of that business year, year over year, which is your job as a, a publisher. And some of the big publishers are public companies. That's their obligation to their shareholders, grow every year. And it's really, really hard to do that. And, and, but my bigger concern is not the publishers, it's the, it's the libraries. And you can see library, or sorry, the authors and the author incomes are really seriously down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the interesting thing in Canada, at least, though, is that, first of all, independent publishers get significant government grants. Mm -hmm. Right? Most of them probably couldn't uh, survive if they didn't get those. Yes. And most of them pay their authors next to nothing. Well, they pay them 10% or whatever they're A 10% royalty on their sales, yes. Right. Yeah. And their sales are generally so low that it amounts to next to nothing. That's interesting, isn't it? It's basically, I'm an author, look at my book. <laughs> but... Uh... Yeah, the, the, that's a whole other conversation, the Canadian book uh, funding network and, and how the government goes about that. Yeah, yeah, let's not go down that, uh, go down that rabbit hole. Okay, so... You talk about uh, the fact 
that writers are loath to criticize libraries for what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I got more criticism for writing the piece than libraries have ever gotten from writers. Um, so, some writers just, they either think that, you know, libraries do great things and therefore shouldn't be criticized, or they think that there are more important things than making money in books and they don't really care that much that their incomes are low. They think uh, finding an audience is the most important thing, which is fine for them. That's not how I see it. But, um, you know, if, if somebody wants to work and write for free, I can't quarrel with that. Right. Yeah, the starving artist. Some people, uh, that's part of the dream. Next in the article, you, you bring up uh, the well-researched, deep dive, long form article that you wrote, not the op-ed. Yes, that one. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You suggest that librarians make five times <laughs> what the average writer makes. So why are you bringing that up? Um, That's a bit of shit disturbing. Uh, yes, it is. I wanted to get their attention. Um, I, I think that the, the position of the author in this is, has been systematically overlooked. And I could just as easily have said that the average publishing executive makes probably 10 times what uh, they, they said. And, and at some point, I'm going to write about, you know, the distribution of income between publishers and, and uh, authors. But that's another, another story for another day. My piece was about libraries and where libraries are positioned in the publishing ecosystem. And it strikes me as absurd to have a system where you can make, you know, five times as much money giving away somebody's work for free than you can by actually producing the work. That, to me, is absurd and counterproductive if you want to encourage a literature encourage people to keep writing, encourage people to put their best into their books and produce the best possible literature they can. Uh, I think you would flip those yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, incomes, yeah. Well, the thing is, if the writer does write something great, they have immortality to look forward to. Oh, they are sure they do, yes, yeah, yeah. Those 17 million books that are being produced a year, you know, every one of them is gonna make their authors immortal, that's for sure. Okay, so you say that pushing bestsellers in competition with book retailers to the detriment of uh, publishers and authors has become an addiction for librarians who, again, rely on steady or growing patronage statistics to justify their funding requests. It has to stop. Mm -hmm. which uh, returns us to the crux of the matter for their funding libraries rely on the traffic generated and this is shit disturbing by pimp <laughs> i shouldn't be laughing here because the librarians from serious don't... stuff it's serious stuff <laughs> generated by pimping free entertainment to people who can afford it all the genuine good they do is to some extent made possible by being a net harm to literature jeez that's a shot across the bow yeah and it's all you know derived from the library's own data their own reports you know that yeah. most most of what they lend is entertainment uh most of their patrons uh, our middle class, upper middle class, uh, I'm sure that 98% of them have Netflix uh, subscriptions. You know, they're not incapable of buying books. And, and uh, yeah, I think it is, uh, in the end, a net harm to literature. And that, you know, leads us to what, if, if anything, we do about this. It is a bit of a pickle because the libraries are dependent on this traffic for funding. And the libraries do do uh, a lot of good things that I'd hate to see them quick doing, um, including to some extent lending, you know. I can't find it exactly where it is, but you talked about their vast funding. Mm -hmm. 
and I, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, it, relative to what? Relative um, to buying oil pipelines? No, certainly not. No, I, I mean, relative to the rest of uh, people who are in uh, the book trade, libraries are certainly better funded than publishers in Canada. They're certainly better funded than authors in Canada um, in, in the ecosystem as it exists in Canada. Libraries have far, far more money. Well, you're not a and it's more reliable. And they, they, ha they don't have to, because they don't sell anything, they don't have to work as hard for it. So you're not out to privatize libraries then? Not in the least, no. Um, no, I, I think there's one aspect of what libraries are doing that's problematic, and that is the lending of a lot of books that really qualify as entertainment to people who can afford it. And uh, that's where most of the traffic is. That's where most of the lost sales to authors in the publishing industry are. And, and that is what I think has to be addressed. And just for the benefit of your viewers, one thing I think we, we need to mention, Nigel, because people always bring this up, is that uh, libraries buy books and, and uh, they do contribute to the uh, publishing ecosystem by buying the books from publishers that they then land out eight or nine times a year. I did take that into account in my calculations and it's still four out of five books in Canada are borrowed rather than bought. So what do we do about this situation? Um, there's there's two, two possible approaches. Uh, one is to say, okay, all this borrowing's happening, but we believe people should be reading as much as possible. We believe that literacy is a public good. Uh, we believe that uh, even if it's Tom Clancy or, or Erica John uh, or, or Judith Krantz, it's uh, good that people are exercising these faculties and, and it may lead them to read better things and awaken them to new ideas and opportunities. Gateway drug. Yeah. So we don't care if it's a net harm to authors and publishers, the, the highest goal is to have people reading as much as possible. If you believe that, I think then that you've declared reading to be a public good, and it's then the government's obligation to make sure that the people who produce the reading materials are uh, adequately compensated. So that means that governments have to step in and compensate the publishers and, and, and the authors whose stuff they believe should be given away free. We have at the moment- They're already doing that though, Ken, aren't they? In yeah, Canada, that's, that's, that's what I was that. just about to say. We have a public lending right, but it gives you, you know, a few pennies when, when your books are borrowed and it's capped at about $400 a year per book, per writer. Uh, so it's well-intentioned, and in aggregate, it's quite a lot of money. It's like, I think, uh, what was it, 25 million over a period of 10 years or something. It, you know, it's something. It's a gesture. It's, it's well-intentioned, but as a practical matter, it's nothing, and it doesn't come close to compensating writers or publishers. So if we believe it's a public good, that public lending right has to be massively expanded so that um, people who are producing the, the books that we think it's very important for everyone to read are adequately compensated for those books, like up to the level where we think you know, it's fair to compensate librarians, for instance. Uh, so that's one approach. Yeah. The, the, the other approach is to say, well, the library's core mission is to uh, serve as a depository of knowledge and, and a resource in its uh, community. And, and the really important things it does are uh, lend books to students and, and, and scholars and people who are learning for jobs and uh, people who need, don't have computer access but need it, people who are in not great financial uh, circumstances and genuinely can't afford books, people who need classes. You know, there's a lot of great things that libraries do, but 
or lending entertainment to people who can afford it isn't one of them. So libraries then either quit doing that or charge people for it. One of the things I suggested uh, was that if people wanted to be high volume borrowers and, and were borrowing books that were more entertainment oriented, that's fine, but charge them a, a monthly Netflix style fee uh, which would be returned to the authors and publishers uh, as compensation for the use of, of their books. And, and the, the librarians are going to have a, a, quite a job of uh, designating what's entertainment and what's not. Well, I don't know. The librarians are pretty good at classifying things. I mean, there'd be a lot of fights over what, what, what is or what isn't and so on. But, you know, we're, we're, we're far from having that having that conversation yet. I, I think just the principle that people who are uh, borrowing in high volumes largely for entertainment should pay is the first, first mm -hmm. fight to have on that one. What about the idea that publishers shouldn't have to uh, sell their best sellers to the libraries right away? They could Okay, well, let, me, let me get to that. So when, okay. when, when I'm talking about the, you know, if you, you have two choices, you either say it's all going to be free and then the government has to do something for publishing and author, or you say that uh, I, either uh, that the libraries are going to have to charge their patrons, uh, which would be like the Netflix style fee, or, or the other thing that's going to happen is the publishers are going to say, look, I'm just not putting these books into libraries, or if you want them in libraries, you're going to have to pay two, three times as much to buy this book and put it out for Kent, borrowing. Do you, want hold, do you want to hold up another uh, Sutherland uh, publication? <laughs> you're getting tired of that one? Yeah. Um, yeah okay. There, there you go. Okay. There we go. I didn't really come well prepared to. Uh, um, uh, it's just one problem. Promote, but I, I'm still a new publisher. I'm not that good at this yet. Well, the other problem is that this is a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. So it's, what, it's, what was that oh, book? What was that book? It was Joe, Joe Barrage's uh, Perfect City. I, I thought you were going to put the whole Zoom thing on online. Uh, well, I'm not I, sure. I dressed up and everything, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... If if libraries can't figure out a way to either have their uh, the government pay more for the books they lend or uh, have patrons pay for it, publishers are going to say, "Screw it, uh, we're going to charge you more for these books, or you're not going to get the books in, in large volume. You won't get co sixty copies at the Toronto system of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. We'll sell you five. Or uh, we'll hold off. We'll hold off for a year. Or we'll wait three months, six months, a year until uh, we put the books into the library system and sell as many as we can in the meantime. And um, that uh, I think is I increasingly going to happen. And where where it's, the rubber's really hitting the road right now, Nigel, is on ebooks. Uh, I don't know if you've gone to your local library system and, and tried to borrow a, a book, but the, the platforms that all the libraries are using now are dead easy to use. You can apply for a card right online. You don't have to get out of your chair, and you can pretty much borrow online digitally any book in the system uh, immediately. That's John, uh, that's John Sargent, right? He was sort of leading that charge with Macmillan. Yeah, John, John Sargent was first publisher in the U.S. to say, look, all of this e-borrowing is, is growing exponentially. And uh, un unlike physical books, which, you know, tend to wear out after, uh, you, you know, you borrow it 16 or 20 times, e-books e last forever you know so you borrow you buy an e-book from us once and you can lend it out 300 times and and uh, we get no further compensation for it 
and we think it's affecting our sales. So what Sargent did was say, I'm going to hold back my books on one imprint that we have for three months and, and just study the effect on sales and see what happens. And he did that. I got a tremendous amount of abuse from librarians. As far as I uh, have been able to learn, keeping the books out for three months did have the uh, effect on sales, the, the positive effect on sales that uh, Macmillan expected. And uh, I think there's likely to be more of this coming ahead. He's a bit concerned about the fact that it's not, you know, you don't just borrow from the library that you have close proximity to you can borrow from all sorts of libraries that's right all over the place. yeah there's almost nothing you can't get yeah and so while well, sergeant's solution was to uh, keep the books out of the libraries for a few months others have been steadily increasing the prices that they're charging for ebooks uh, so that uh, a book that you might be able to get for $12 on Kindle, a library has to pay $60 for. And that $60 may only be for a license to use the book for two years. It has to be renewed in a couple of years and so on. So the cost of the ebooks is going up quite a lot. The way it looks to me is that the publishers have said, you know, as far as hard books are concerned, paperbacks, hardcovers, for now, we're going to let the libraries continue to do what the, they're uh, doing, but we'll be damned if we're going to let the libraries do what they're doing with, e you know, ebooks and audiobooks and and kill those fast-growing businesses for yeah. us. Uh, and they are fast-growing. Most of the new revenue that's coming to publishers, for instance, has been audiobooks. But also, you know, you look at what's happening in libraries, and much of the new demand is for audiobooks. So there, there, there's um, a real collision coming. Uh, you read Library Journal, you read Publishers Weekly and, and uh, what the librarians are writing on there. And they see this as uh, you know, the fight of their lives that they have to convince publishers to um, make uh, electronic books, whether eBooks or uh, audio books available to meet the public demand at libraries. Uh, on terms that library librarians can afford and the publishers are saying no uh, we can't afford to have you giving away these books and making it dead easy for people to get access to them or we'll never sell another one uh, why would you when it's e actually easier to go on and borrow a book from a library than it is to um, buy the book or the uh, audiobook you know is it's frictionless uh, that that's uh, that that's a huge problem so that's where that's where the real fight's going to be uh, in in the coming years uh, and both sides have sworn that this is a you know a fight to the finish that um, <laughs> we, we're not gonna back down let's get a little taste of that fight okay okay I I just want to change gears a bit as we slowly wind down here by, <laughs> by quoting from a response in Publishers Weekly from a librarian, Mary Chevreau, who is chair of the Canadian Urban Libraries Council and CEO of the Kitchener Public Library. Now, I invited her to participate in the bibliophile and she was uh, happy to do so but then at the last minute said she only wanted to talk about you for five to ten minutes and i figured this is way too big a topic yeah i'm worth more than five minutes come well, on i, I yeah, figured you are yeah. Yeah, yeah well especially seeing as you wrote this long form 3500 deep, words yes 3500 mm -hmm. word how long did it take you to write that? Months and months. Months. And she only wants to give you five to ten minutes. It's crazy. So what was the response like? Well, I was mean and a stupid head is basically what the response from the librarians was. Uh, and uh, 
they fell back on their usual lines about, you know, essential public services, a foundation of democracy, none of which I really uh, disagree with. But curiously, they didn't, and none of them, and it's been almost a month now, none of them have gone after my numbers. Uh, none of them have denied that four out of five books uh, are given away in Canada for free. None of him. In the, the states, Ken, you, you provide it's, it's something like three point two or three point one to one. Canadians like their libraries a little more than Americans do. So you know they haven't really challenged any of my data. They didn't. They completely avoided the uh, issue of them claiming that uh, on the one hand that uh, every book borrowed is a lost sale yet somehow that's not harmful at all to literature. You know, they, they, they've avoided the issues. What they've done too here is, quote, his rhetoric is demonstrative of a broader disdain for public service and an argument for privatization. Are they placing you back in Alberta with the Alberta report? Is that what they're doing? Um, uh, yeah, I think they're trying to say that this guy is a conservative whack job. Yeah, um, and and I guess that that'll make them feel better uh, and and give them an excuse not to uh, address the real arguments. Uh, that, that that's fine if they want to play that way. I should add though that a lot of librarians did uh, respond sensibly and and did engage with the. Uh, the issues and some of some of them emailed me directly to talk about it but regardless you know i th i think it's it really betrays the librarian's mindset that they they would suggest that i was trying to privatize books i mean the, the book industry's always been private uh, private industry uh, you know writers sell their books to publishers or sell them to the public. Uh, it's been like that since the dawn of time. What they say is it's hard to understand why public libraries are to blame when bookstores and, and libraries have coexisted harmoniously and supported each other for decades. And that's ignoring the point you make that lending and borrowing is, has doubled in the last, what, 20 20 years or so, right? Yeah, the, the, the libraries have vastly expanded their footprints, you know, from so about 1970 onward, and, and the borrowing per capita has doubled o o over that time. So yes, there's far more lending going on now than there was before. And uh, they also point out that uh, chain stores and Amazons have hurt, uh, Amazon have hurt publishing, which I, I entirely agree with. I've written a lot about Amazon and got a lot more to come. Uh, but, you know, Amazon and, and chain stores buy and sell books. So writers and publishers are compensated. They, they have perhaps upended to some extent the book selling ecosystem, but they're still at least playing within the book selling ecosystem. They're not running entirely outside it like libraries are and, and making things free. You still have to buy a book on Amazon. So to me, that's a much lesser problem than, than uh, what we're dealing with with public libraries. Here's another point they make that it says research shows that library borrowers are also book buyers. Yeah, mm -hmm. they always trot out that study. Uh, and I don't know what they expect it to mean. Um, you know, that, that doesn't change the fact that four out of five books are borrowed uh, and doesn't change the fact that... Uh, if only three out of those uh, five books were borrowed, author incomes would probably double and and uh, take them all, you know, authors almost halfway to uh, uh, being paid as well as librarians. Um, the fact that some people who borrow a book also buy books is, is uh, uh, an, a nice thing, but it's completely irrelevant to the argument. You make a point of saying that people who can't afford uh, books sh uh, should be given special recognition within the library system, right? You've, you said that in the article. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. So what they say, I think children and people who can't afford it should be able to borrow all they want. Yeah. They suggest that you call the benighted underclass do not deserve or should not have access to recreational material. So what's that? They're trying to make the argument that uh, I'm, I'm anti-entertainment and which is preposterous. I'm not. I, uh, uh, I just think people should pay for it uh, like they do for all other forms of enter entertainment. Well, I think they're saying too that you think poor people should pay for it as well. Yeah, no, I was quite explicit about the fact that people who don't have the means should absolutely have access to uh, everything that a library offers. Yeah, and in fact, this is the point she ends off on, and she says that public libraries are democratic institutions that are critical to civil society. More and more playing a crucial role in empowering citizens to thrive in today's changing world by providing the essential tools, connectivity, and information in all its forms. And most importantly, libraries are committed to providing equitable access to the widest range of human knowledge, experience, and ideas. That includes John Grisham and uh, Jessman Ward. That's how it ends. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with most of that. I, I, um... Equitable access to the widest range of human knowledge. So she's saying that everyone should have free access to all the entertainment stuff that you're objecting to. Well, yeah, I don't know. I guess we can quarrel over what's equitable. I think having it available at a low price uh, is, is very equitable and you can buy a John Grisham online. Anyone can for 10 bucks. Uh, if you find that high, you can buy a used one for five bucks, you know, or you can go read Wilkie Collins for free on, uh, many, many of the digital, uh, uh, services, uh, well, including Google books, uh, that, that are already out there. So there's, there's no shortage of literature for people who are looking uh, for it. I don't think equitable means that you should be able to get all of the best selling product for nothing, no matter uh, whether you can afford it or, or not. Uh, that to me is not equitable. It's not fair to the writers. It's not fair to the publishers and, and it's not fair to booksellers either. Okay. Here's your last word on the topic, but I'm, I'm hoping you're going to, give me the last last word okay after. yeah what we need is an independent third party study to examine the impact of libraries on publishing i'm not talking about another library sponsored conjuring of fake economic value some level of government that funds libraries needs to hire a consulting firm or some other creditable outfit to quantify the impact of borrowing on the commercial publishing industry and author's incomes. Given the vast sums we spend on our, yeah, there's that vast sums, vast mm -hmm. sums we spend on our libraries annually, isn't it something we want to know? Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do we go from here instead, of, you know, so you've called for a study, so what do we do? What, what I, I guess I'm saying there is uh, that I don't expect anyone to take my article in depth as it is, you know, 3,500 words long, months of work on it. I, I really don't think not it, a, it's not an op-ed. It's certainly not an op-ed, but it should also not be the last word on this. And, and it's bizarre to me that we have this uh, lending regime out there for books and nobody has actually ever impartially studied the impact it has on the publishing industry. Not the publishers, not the librarians, not the funders of the librarians. And if books are so critical 
to our culture and so critical to our democracy why the hell hasn't anybody studied this as you know is it true what the libraries say that every book that's borrowed is a lost sale or am i right that you know one in four uh, books that's borrowed is a, a lost sale uh, are there other dimensions that none of us are thinking about to me this is something that should really seriously uh, be studied before we decide what the best remedy is, whether it's a bigger public lending right or it's a Netflix style fee or it's publishers rationing books, not giving them as many to, to libraries or charging a lot more. We, we should really quantify the problem and see as best we can what it is, how it works, who's hit worst, um, and look at uh, possible solutions. Uh, so I, I think that's the next step. And if I was somebody who was putting billions into a library system, which the Toronto you know, uh, municipality, city of Toronto is doing, or the provincial government, which also was a big funder of libraries, or the federal government, which has a heritage department, which sees itself as responsible for Canadian literature broadly. Uh, um, I think one of those agencies uh, or the public publishers themselves, you know, there's an American Publishers Association, which includes Simon & Schuster and Random House and all these other agencies could very easily uh, hire McKinsey or Boston Consultant uh, or even the Authors Guild for God's sake, uh, which is a reasonably large uh, organization which has some wealthy patrons could go and say to one of them, look, we want to spend a uh, half a million dollars get, getting this study done so we really understand the impact that borrowing has on our trade and our incomes. Somebody should do that. That to me is the next step. I'm afraid nobody's going to do it. What we're going to have instead is this war between publishers and libraries and and more rationing of books, more increased fees for publisher sales to libraries of books, and a lot of bitter complaining back and forth. Okay, well, thank you for, uh, for writing this in-depth article and <laughs> for attacking motherhood. And I just have a quick question to end it, and that is, how do you expect your publishing firm going forward to survive without any library sales? Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, you know, one of those things that if I was a shrewder person, I would have thought more about before. But, uh, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a small publisher, a library, all of my sales are small, including my library sales. Um, and, uh uh, I, I didn't approach this in a kind of a self-interested way. I, I was more interested in it as uh, an intellectual exercise in my understanding of what actually happens in the publishing industry and uh, whatever the outcome isn't really going to affect my business in, in any substantial way. But as, as someone who's concerned for books and, and who, who likes authors, publishers, libraries, and booksellers and would like to see them all survive and flourish i think we've got to address this and so that's why i took it on okay so self-interestedly then what's your hottest title coming up what's the hot one that that everyone should buy oh that's a great question you know uh one that's kind of related to uh, this issue is a book by Philip Slayton called Nothing Left to Lose. And it's about public discourse generally. And what Philip argues is that we as Canadians are very deferential and, and we don't ask ourselves hard questions and, and we tend to just uh, throw a blanket over our issues and our problems. And he's advocating for a less deferential, uh, more open, and sometimes even combative conversation, because by addressing important issues and, and confronting them head on, we're more likely to uh, come to solutions and advance as a society. And, and 
And I entirely agree with that uh, perspective. And it was somewhat in that spirit that I wrote this piece. Philip has a lot to say about contemporary politics, uh, how we handle uh, things like the COVID uh, outbreak. Um, I, I think people who are interested in you know, the, the larger public conversation and how it works and uh, where it helps us and where it's failing us would really find uh, a lot to read there. So it's Philip Slayton, Nothing Left to Lose, brought to you by Sutherland House. And it, from your perspective, where's the best place for someone to go buy it? What's your website? Sutherlandhousebooks.com. You can get a signed copy there. For the same price? For the same price as you can get it in a uh, bookstore, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that and for uh, agreeing to... Uh, I didn't really combat with you. I wanted to be a bit more combative, but uh, I kind of tend to agree with everything pretty well everything you've said except for the vastness there you, you think we should spend more on libraries i think that's a legit argument by the way it wouldn't well, have got too competitive if you've done that especially the national library yes yes i also think we should spend less on architecture and and more on services but that's a whole other argument yeah so that you know li libraries are really important and really interesting and we should talk about them more. I'm surprised people, you know, much as they use them, they aren't, they aren't interested in uh, r really talking about them. But anyway, I'm very uh, happy that you had me on, Nigel, big fan of the podcast and, and uh, glad that you've been able to keep it going through uh, all this mess over the last few months. Very good. Ken White is the publisher of Southern House Books and the author of the weekly Shush newsletter. His latest book is called Hoover, An Extraordinary Life in Extraordinary Times. What are you working on now? I have another book coming out next year. It's called The Sack of Detroit, and it's about what happened to General Motors in the 1960s.